Well, good morning, church family, and welcome to my living room. Under uh, unusual circumstances in the last 48 hours has led to our entire family having to be quarantined and having have us having to make a radical shift in how we do worship this weekend. But we encourage you to, to join us in worship today. Uh, it might be from your living room or your kitchen table. This brings us back a few months ago when we were doing this every week. But I just want to thank you for your texts and calls. We are all doing fine. Uh, we have no symptoms and doing well. And uh, we're just kind of waiting out the time and quarantine and uh, being back with you again, hopefully in a couple weeks. I will have some announcements at the end of today's live stream that are of, of mass importance. So I want you to uh, pay attention, uh, follow all the way through, worship together. I want you to sing and incorporate the worship as we, as we do our songs this morning. And then as we wrap up our Jeremiah series, grab your Bibles. The sermon notes are posted on our Facebook page. You can upload them or you can just uh, follow along in, in God, your copy of God's Word as we worship uh, together this morning. So let's do that now. Let me open with a word of prayer, and then we'll begin our time of worship together. Father God, we just thank you so much for who you are. God, you are in control when the world around us seems chaotic, and you are of supreme importance as we worship you. And that's what our focus is this morning, as we celebrate you, as we think about what it means to gather together virtually this morning as the body of the believers, as the body of, of Christ and the church, I pray that you just allow us to worship you this morning with everything that we are. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, let's uh, begin our worship together, church, with indescribable. Containable, you place the stars in the sky and you know them by. 
days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sword. Still we are the voice in the desert, crying, prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's the year of Jubilee. He 
even when it feels like I'm surrounded, you never leave my side. Oh, nobody loves me like you love me, Jesus. I stand in awe of your amazing ways. I worship you as long as I am breathing. God, you are faithful and true. Nobody loves me like you. Oh, what a song to sing. Oh, what a song to sing. Oh, what a song to sing. Oh, what a song my heart keeps singing. Oh, what a song to sing. Oh, what a song. song to sing Jesus you love me and I love you God nobody loves me like you love me Jesus I stand in all of your amazing ways I worship you as long as I am breathing God I will worship you Heaven may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. My God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. I'm not backing down from any giants. Because I know how this story ends. Yes, I know how this story ends. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory, belongs to you, Lord. Take what the enemy meant for evil 
And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good You take what the enemy meant for evil And you turn it for good You turn it for good Turn it for good, you turn it for good. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm going to see a victory, I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. so thankful that the battle belongs to you. And no matter what life throws at us, no matter what challenges we encounter on a day-to-day experience of this thing we call life, we know that you are in control, we know that you are great, and we know that you are powerful. And you give us the courageous faith in challenging Time. So as we come to you now, as we worship you, as we turn to your word and we look at the application you have for us this morning from your uh, great instruction manual, God, we turn and we just give honor and praise to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning again, church, and, and it's just uh, such a, a challenging time for sure, this 2020 continues to bring around um, challenges and different experiences that we would last. It's been an interesting 48 hours for us, and as we've had to make some changes in our schedule and routine, but we want to. I want to reiterate that none of us currently are positive for uh, coronavirus. We were just exposed to someone who is, and asked by the health department to quarantine out of precaution. There is no case at church that I'm aware of. Uh, but we've kind of shut down for two weeks, allowed things to settle down, uh, and allowed us to serve out our quarantine time. And I just pray for us as we continue to, to be here and to that we stay symptom-free and that we don't contract the virus. And, and we trust it that all will be well with that. And like I said, because of that, we've had to make some shifts in, in, in schedule. So be tuning in at the end after our message uh, this morning uh, for announcements regarding that. But I want you to turn to Jeremiah chapter 45 as we finish up this series and as we wrap up this series, Courageous Faith in Challenging Times. I, I think it's quite interesting as we've been walking through this series, part one and then again part two, uh, over the last part of 2020, what we've seen through this study. And, and I, for one, was getting a little burnt out on the, just the doom and gloom of Jeremiah. But I want to leave you this morning as we wrap this up with what is I call a final encouraging word by Jeremiah. So turn in your Bibles, if you will, Jeremiah chapter 45. And I'll explain why we're not at the very end of Jeremiah here with this final encouraging word in just a minute. But Jeremiah chapter 45, verses 1 through 5. I want to read that uh, this morning says this, the word that Jeremiah the prophet spoke to Baruch, the son of Neriah, when he wrote these words in a book at the dictation of Jeremiah in the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to you, O Baruch, you said, woe is me, for the Lord has added sorrow to my pain. I am weary with groaning and I find no rest. Thus shall you say to him, thus says the Lord, Behold, what have I built I am breaking down, and what I have planted I am plucking up. That is the whole land. And do not 
Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. I think about the challenging times that Jeremiah has for us. And I, and I think about what all Jeremiah went through as a prophet of God, as being called by God to deliver a difficult message to a difficult people that wasn't going to listen to him. And, and we think about all the uh, despair that Jeremiah went through. Well, here in this final word that we have of his, Jeremiah chapter 44 is actually the final word to the Israelites. And then Jeremiah chapter 45 is Jeremiah's final word to his scribe, Baruch. We find an encouraging word in times of despair. There was a man who stopped to watch a little league baseball game. And he asked one of the youngsters what the score was. And he said, well, we're losing 18 to nothing. And it was the answer. And he said, well, I must say that you don't look discouraged. Discouraged? said the boy, why should we be discouraged? We haven't even come to bat yet. And that's kind of where Jeremiah is with that. And, and let's be honest, I know many of you were feeling weary with this Old Testament prophecy. That's okay. I was as well. And this has not been an easy book to preach. I knew going in that that was going to be the case, but it seemed even more difficult with all the things that 2020 has thrown at us and with that said, uh, we're going to wrap that up today with an encouraging word, and it's this. Jeremiah, my Jeremiah, if you will hit the next slide, I'll kind of point to you when it's needed. Oh, oh, we went too far. That's all right. We'll leave it there. Life is hard, but trust in God. Life is hard, but trust in God. You see, Jeremiah brings this final message to his people. And if you think about all that he has promised, and, and including the judgments on all parties, judgment on Babylon, judgment on the enemies of Israel, judgment on Israel themselves in exile. And we can take the next few weeks, and that's what I originally planned to do, was take the next few weeks and, and go through each of these countries and go through the, each of these scenarios. And I just decided that was way too much doom and gloom for us. We just needed to kind of summarize this with this thought. When we reject God through disobedience, God displays his wrath on us. And with each of the remaining chapters in this book of prophecy, we see that come true. God's judgment displayed on the nation of Egypt, the Philistines, Moab, Ammon, Edom, <coughs> Babylon, and even his own people Israel because of their sin with the destruction of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about it. God hates sin. And he takes sin seriously. And for many of these nations, they chose to ignore that warning repeatedly. And because of that, they suffered the price. For the people of God, they also suffered. They suffered a 70-year exile in Babylon, separated from the presence of God. But I don't want you to miss this with this series. I don't want you to miss God's grace. You see, yeah, God is just, and he, he judges us when we sin against him. But in his grace, he leaves something for us. For the nation of Israel, he left a righteous remnant who would continue the family lineage all the way to Jesus. And that message of Jeremiah from the very beginning that we've talked about so many times rings true. Despite our sin, God is determined to rescue us, even especially when we display a willingness to return to him. That's the whole message of Jeremiah. Yeah, it's a lot of bad news, and it's a lot of doom and gloom, but the message of Jeremiah is, is there. And the message of Jeremiah is the idea that uh, despite that, God wants our best interest at heart. God wants to rescue us. God wants to, for us to return to him. And, and let's face it, God's people are rebellious, right? They request God's word from the prophet only to reject it. And then they return to their sin, and that weighs heavily on Jeremiah. He weeps over their brokenness because he knows that, 
that God is going to judge them. He, we see in this message to Baruch, his scribe, how weary and struggles he finds, so much so that he can't find rest, right? And the same is true for people lost in sin today. The effects of the world can be wearisome, can't they? The effects of this year can cause us to be consumed with great sorrow about all the things we're missing. But I want you to hear this, church. There is hope. God's encouraging word comes with a question. And that question is one I want you to answer for yourselves this morning. He asked Baruch, he asked this question, Are you seeking great things for yourself or for God? And out of that question comes our focus this morning. You see, there are three great changes in our thinking that help us create encouragement in times of despair. There's three changes in our thinking that we need to make. And so many people today, Christians and non-Christians, they're caught up in what? Selfish thinking. Did you watch the debate the other night? You know, a philosophy that's not new to our world. It, it's, it's even in the Old Testament, in a, in a, a prayer embodied in the prayer of Jabez. First Chronicles 4.10 says this, Oh, that you would bless me. And enlarge my border, and that your hand might be with me, and that you would keep me from harm, so that it might not bring me pain. Do you see all the personal pronouns in that sentence, right? The idea of, of selfishness even was in the Old Testament. But yet compare that to God's encouraging word that he gives Jeremiah, he gives Baruch in Jeremiah 45, 5. He says this, do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not, for behold, I am bringing disaster upon all flesh. Now, that doesn't sound like encouraging news, but I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places in which you may go. An opposite thinking that displays joy in our lives, right? Compare the two, we would rather be the Baruch response than the prayer of Jabez Response, that joy represented in that simple analogy, Jesus first, others second, yourself last. It's that mentality that we need to have in this world. For Jeremiah, this is the end of his prophetic messages. There's no other word said by Jeremiah than just the judgment and the reality of it. The people have rejected God and they'll face the judgment. And out of that, only a remnant of once was will remain. So for us today, when faced with challenging times, we put things in focus by responding to the warnings and returning to God. So let's look together at the short little chapter and the three changes that need to happen in our thinking. First, we see this one. In verse 3, focus on the eternal prize instead of the temporary pain. I mean, let's face it. Sometimes it's hard to see the forest for the trees when it comes to our walk with God, right? I mean, we can become so lost in our sin that, that we don't know which way is up. And, and we can even become blinded by our sin and, so that we don't know how even to respond. And for God's people, that was the case. Jeremiah was, was God's prophet to warn them of their sin, to warn them of the judgment. And if they didn't change, they were going to enjoy, suffer this judgment. But the, the fact is, they didn't change. They enjoyed their sinful lifestyle so much. They didn't listen to the warnings. And ultimately, they were exiled into a foreign land, Babylon. For Jeremiah, that was a very painful process. You see, he didn't like to see his own people in exile. He didn't like to see his own people go through that. And even though he knew that's what was happening, God told him. He was heartbroken over the people's response, so much so that it caused him great sorrow. So here in this message to his scribe, Baruch, he expresses this feeling of, of great pain, so much so that it even influences Baruch, uh, Barak, Baruch, who was a judgment soul supporter in all these messages. Think about this. Think about the negative impact that this must have had on Jeremiah. Jeremiah's legacy reads as this, faithful to God and only one supporter from the flock. 
faithful to God and only one supporter from the flock. How would the world look at that? All those years of prophecy, over 40 years of, of prophecy, the world would look at that as an absolute failure, right? One convert in 40 years, but not God. You see, when we are faced with despair, it is, it's easy to become discouraged. It's easy to lose hope, yet we're reminded of this simple message to simply change our focus. We're reminded of that when times come, the best medicine we can receive in those despairing times is an encouraging word. The word encouragement is defined as this. The action of sharing courage with someone by delivering confidence of, or hope. What we need more than anything in the world right now, as the last few months of 2020 are upon us, what we need more than anything is hope. It's a courageous faith in challenging times. That is simply an encouraging word. Instead of focusing on the temporary pain, we need to focus on the eternal prize. For Jeremiah and Baruch, that prize is life. God reminded him that one day he would bring judgment on all the world, but the worldly power, the popularity, the prestige would all go away. But what would only matter is eternity. To seek a name for yourself, a place of distinction among men, is to search for the wrong thing in the wrong place. Look at our world today. To seek social media greatness or internet fame shows a lack of appreciation for the Creator, God. Philippians 2, 3 says this, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Do nothing for selfish ambition. God's assurance to Jeremiah was strong and to Baruch. He would take care of them. Even when they were taken to Egypt, kicking and screaming all the way against their will, that promise is true. Now please understand that that doesn't mean that life's going to be easy. Because we know it isn't. It's going to be filled with challenges along the way. Following Jesus demands courageous action. Ironically, the very suffering that Baruch experienced because of his loyalty to Jeremiah gained him honor beyond anything he could have anticipated. Likewise, the pain we experience here on earth by being faithful to Jesus is temporary. And the benefits are so worth it. We must focus on the eternal prize instead of the temporary Pain. But the second change in focus is this. One more time. There you go. Focus on the good that comes out of the grief. When bad things happen, and they will, <laughs> it's easy to miss the good. We could look at this prophecy from Jeremiah as one tragic story. Right? We could, we could look at this as a, just a rejection of God's people and completely miss the good that comes out of it. Well, what good comes out of it, right? The people go into exile. Jeremiah is taken to Egypt against his will. Where's the good? The good is in the future. The remnants of those faithful who survived the exile, the 70 years, and then go on to provide the legacy. The remnant that is faithful despite their sin experiences out of that a renewed focus and a rejuvenated spirit to draw them closer to God. I've asked this question before, and maybe you have as well, but what if God is using the events of 2020 and all the disappointments and all the chaos to do the same for us today, to change or focus. You see, Jeremiah has experienced his share of despair. Despite being faithful to God's call on his life and his courageous action, he has been physically attacked. He's been thrown in prison. He's even left in an old cistern for dead. But we couldn't even understand it. it we would understand if Jeremiah just simply wanted to give up, wanted to throw in the towel, wanted to walk away from it all. 
But here in the end of this prophecy, we see just the opposite. Despite the judgment surrounding God's people, Jeremiah offers this final message of encouragement to help strengthen Baruch's faith. You see, unlike Ishmael, who couldn't accept the reality of the people's exile to Babylon, as we looked at last week, with all the struggles, Jeremiah didn't sugarcoat their situation. Just as God promised, what he built up, he broke down. And what he planted, he plucked up to restore them toward him. This process came with suffering, but in the end, they're better off. The remnants left humble to get back at the heart of what it means to worship God and to put him first in our lives. What does it mean to truly worship the King of Kings? And the Lord of Lords. Well, William Temple said this about worship. He said this. He said, For worship is the submission of all our nature to God. It is the quickening of conscience by His holiness, the nourishment of mind with His truth, the purifying of imagination by His beauty, the opening of His heart to His love, the surrender of His will to His purpose, and all of this gathered up in adoration. Listen, the most selfless emotion of which our nature is capable and therefore the chief remedy for all self-centeredness, which is our original sin and the source of all actual sin. That's what it means to worship. Changing our focus doesn't magically make our problems disappear. Man, I wish it did, right? I mean, I really wish if we could just change our focus and focus on the eternal uh, promise and focus on the uh, good and not the grief, that all our problems would just disappear. You know what's going to happen to Jeremiah and Baruch, if you're not familiar with the story? They're still going to be taken to Egypt against their will. They're still going to be held in captive because the people are going to get tired of their message. They're still going to be punished. They're still going to seek shelter in a foreign land. They're still going to experience heartache with all the destruction that comes. And we are going to experience our own trials when we choose to live faithful to God. But listen, church, here's the hope. Here's the good news. Instead of being overwhelmed by the trials, we can find great hope because of what God will do through the trials. To experience encouragement requires a change of focus. We must change from uh, eternal prize instead of temporary pain. We must focus on the good instead of the grief. But third, verse 5 tells us this. Focus on the selfless life instead of the selfish life. The final change in thinking brings the greatest encouragement. Apparently some of uh, Baruch's discouragements and exhaustions came from seeking great things. Listen to what God says in verse 5. He says, Do you seek great things for yourself? Seek them not. For behold, I am bringing disaster upon the flesh, declares the Lord. But I will give you your life as a prize of war in all places to which you may go. I love what God says there. Hey, are you seeking yourself? Stop it. Right? Seek me. Seek me first and all that is me. And I will give you the reward. I will give you the prize of life. Maybe that is where you find yourself this morning. It's extremely easy to experience disappointment and even despair when life doesn't go your way. Baruch was an educated man. He was qualified as a scribe, one of the few people in the Old Testament who knew how to write. That's why he was where he was in the position given to him by Jeremiah. His brother was an officer of the high rank under King Zedekiah. He could have entertained hopes of some distinction within the nation. Yet whatever great things he sought for himself, they disappeared when he was loyal to Jeremiah. The disappointment of great things weighed heavily on him. But God didn't change his thinking. God allowed him 
changed his thinking from self-ish to selfless. So how do we do that? Well, through the encouraging word of a close friend. You see, Jeremiah helped him not to be concerned about his own advancements, but to be content with God's ability to do even greater things through him. You know, we sing that song in, in worship, great things. We didn't sing it this morning, but we sang it, sung it before. And God does do great things in our lives. But you know that God even wants to do greater things for us. God would, would use the word of Baruch. He would use this word of encouragement to speak throughout many generations. One of them was a guy by the name of Charles Spurgeon. You see, when Charles Spurgeon was 18, he applied to Regents Park College. An interview was set, but through a misunderstanding, he missed the appointment, and he didn't get admitted to the university. And he was bitterly disappointed by this, and almost more so in himself, and he's walking along the countryside trying to calm himself down, and suddenly he remembered Jeremiah 45, 5. And Spurgeon never made it to college. But he went on to become the most effective preacher in England. You see, the sin of selfishness is easy. And if we're honest with ourselves, we all struggle with it. It can be so easy to think of how our sin and how even the sin of others can affect us. But instead, we need to think about how our sin and how the sin of a nation affects all of us. The prize of faithful endurance with God outweighs the false endorsement of temporary gain on our own. For Jeremiah, man, he was faithful to the end, despite his lack of worldly success. And because of that, him and Baruch were greatly blessed. You see, his leadership helped his people survive many disasters including the capture of Jerusalem and the 70 years in exile. And according to extra-biblical sources, Jeremiah lived out his final days in Egypt, where he was finally rewarded for his faithfulness by being stoned to death by his own people. They just couldn't take his messages of repentance anymore. You see, through this series, we have seen his courageous faith. And hopefully, maybe along the way, we've learned a few lessons to display our own faith with courage. Jeremiah had more to say about repentance than any other prophet. He called upon his people on multiple occasions to turn away from the sin and turn back to God and from their wicked ways. And the final lesson that we can learn from him is to learn from the mistakes of God's people and not have a repeat of history. Let me close with this. In the movie, We Bought a Zoo, Benjamin Mee, a British writer played by Matt Damon, decides on a whim to, to rescue a failing zoo with, when it, while coming to terms with his uh, life after losing his wife. And this is one line from the movie that is both personal and powerful and, and unforgettable. And he says this, Sometimes all you need is 20 seconds of insane courage. You see, that's not just a great line, but adopting that mentality will, will make an enormous impact on our lives. Life is crazy. Life is chaotic. But if we display insane courage, even for just 20 seconds, it can change everything. Having courageous faith to take the first step off the zip line. Having courageous faith to surrender your heart to Jesus and allow him to be Lord and Savior of your life. Having this courageous faith to take crazy risk that don't make any sense with the world. Having courageous faith, even in challenging times, to be like Jeremiah, to faithfully follow God's call, even when you know that the people aren't going to listen, 
even when you know that there are going to be times of challenges in front of you. That's a final encouraging word. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. God, you are good. And as we end this series and we think about all the different directions this book of prophecy has given us, we first and foremost think about this one. Life is hard, but we trust in you. Life is filled with challenges, but we know that you are in control. And life demands courageous faith. Help us to display that in our world. Help us to display that this week with people we come into contact with, our co-workers, our friends, our school mates, whatever it may be. Help us to follow you and to surrender to your call. Father, we love you. We thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. I want to thank you guys for tuning in this morning. I know these are uh, crazy times and uh, unforeseen circumstances, but I want to thank you for tuning in. I'll have this uploaded on our YouTube channel uh, by this afternoon, so if you know somebody who's not on Facebook and wants to get that message, you can share that with them. That way, you can access that through our website, carriermillsfirst.org. Let me close. I mentioned some important announcements. Let me close with these five things you need to know, and these are very important for the upcoming next couple weeks. First off is this. We've made the decision because of the quarantine. I got in touch with the Egyptian Health Department yesterday. They've given me a release date, and that's going to go through next Sunday. So obviously for today and next Sunday, we will continue with our online-only format. So that will affect next Sunday as well. With that comes the second one is that it affects the picnic. Unfortunately, we're going to have to postpone the picnic. But here's the good news. It's only for two weeks. We're still going to have the picnic. At this time, it's going to happen October 25th. So get the 11th out of your head and put the 25th in your head. And that's when the picnic is going to be uh, God willing, unless we have some other unforeseen circumstances. Third, we made this decision prior to Friday and us getting the news that we had to quarantine. But it only makes sense at this point as well. But we are going to postpone our midweek services uh, due to the COVID number and increase in our area and just the idea to be able to allow for more cleaning. We've made the decision that it's best in our interest to probably just suspend our midweek services. So we'll still have our Sunday morning and Sunday night gatherings once my quarantine is over, uh, hopefully resuming on October 18th. Uh, but no midweek services uh, from here on out, at least in the, in the near future, uh, to just allow for this all to settle down. I uh, encourage you. Also, October, here's some good news. October is Operation Christmas Child emphasis. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to go out and pack a box. I want you to go out to Dollar Tree, Walmart, buy some stuff, put it in a box. At the end of the month, you'll have an opportunity to bring those boxes to church. And we'll be able to gather all the boxes we had back in July along with October and be able to send those out to Operation Christmas Child and let them uh, be able to still celebrate Christmas with some kids, get them, uh, change their heart with the gospel and, and a gift, and just encourage you to do that. If you can't go it out, uh, like myself, and you can't go shopping right now, uh, you can always make a donation to the church and we can use that money. And Women on Mission will be using that money to then purchase items and, and fill boxes as well. Some of the funds that you have already given to Operation Christmas Child will help cover the shipping costs as well. So we'll have a great day of celebration with that on Sunday, November 1st. Uh, but until then, I want you to be thinking about packing a box. Do some as a family. Do three or four as a family. Do uh, some as a Sunday school class. Whatever you want, in whatever way you want to do it. Uh, just encourage you to pack a box, change a child's life. Boy or girl, any age you pick, whatever uh, you would like to do. There's all kinds of information on Operation Christmas Child's website. I shared a link earlier, I think it was last night, on our Facebook page about how you can do that. You can even choose to pack one online, virtually, and just submit a donation and they will take care of everything else. So however you need to do that, support this great ministry, support this great cause. And then finally, I just want to give you a, a heads up with some other important news. We've got some great sermon series coming up in November and December. Uh, these two great sermon series. First one in November, A Generous Life. 
the beauty of giving. We're going to look at what it means to be generous, not just with our money, but with our time and our talents and our gifts that God has given us. And then also as we approach Advent and we get into Christmas time, I thought about uh, the Christmas focus this year and what it would look like, and I've kind of landed on this, and this just sums up 2020 in a nutshell. A weary world rejoices. Why we can still celebrate Christmas. So I'm really excited about those upcoming series. I hope you're excited about worshiping together in a couple weeks when we're able to join back together in worship. Thank you again for understanding the situation. And just pray you have a good day. Uh, pray you have a good week. And we look forward to worshiping with you in person in a couple weeks. Uh, make sure you tune in next week online as well. Let's close with our blessing, church. Pray continuously. Pursue Christ always. Persevere courageously. Have a good week, church.